the University of New Hampshire, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the session on robot path planning. We have three fantastic talks. The first one is on incremental ARA star, and uh, we'll let Sven Koning uh, describe the work. It's by Joe Johnson, William Yeo, Tan Solaris, and Sven. Okay, thank you. So, so it turns out that actually the first three authors, um, students or ex-students of mine, really wrote the papers, uh, but, but no one could make it to the conference, so they sent me instead. So um, I'll talk about incremental ERE star, which we believe to be the first anytime incremental search algorithm for moving target search. So our motivation here is actually not robots, um, it's games. Uh, and in particular in games, often we have sort of some game character like this one that I call the hunter. And it has to, uh, to catch up with some other game character like that one here, which I would call the target. Now the target is moving, it could be a friendly character, if you just want to catch up with the target to have a chat with them, but it could also be a prey you know, that you want to hunt. Now we are concerned here with the strategy for the hunter, and I make the, the assumptions here that the hunter knows the trend, the hunter knows his own cell, and the hunter knows the cell of the target. So that's sort of a version of what's called in the AI moving target search. Now the hunter could use offline search here, and that's often sort of a form of minimax search, um, like for example Nathan Sturtevant's uh, reverse minimax E star algorithm. Now, offline search has a sort of a disadvantage, and that is that you need to find a huge conditional plan, sort of a policy for the hunter, right? So that for every movement that, that the target is going to make, the hunter has sort of some response ready. Now that typically uh, is uh, computationally very intensive, which might not be so important if it's offline, um, but you also need to store the policy, so you need a lot of memory uh, that's usually unwieldy. And therefore, in most cases, what you want to do is an online search. So um, you want to interleave for the hunter uh, movements uh, with planning. And in this particular case, the hunter can get away with repeated deterministic searches, right? So for example, using the following very, very simple strategy here, the hunter finds a short path from its current cell to the current cell of the target, and then moves along that path. And it keeps doing that as long as the target remains on the path. And when the target leaves the path, then the hunter doesn't quite know how to move. So what it does is it just uh, repeats the process and again finds a short path from its now current position to the current position of the target and moves along that path and so on. Uh, so this is a good strategy. Um, if the hunter has some kind of a speed advantage over the target, either can move faster or the target from time to time makes sort of suboptimal moves uh, so that the hunter can eventually catch the target. So for games, that's actually quite a good strategy, and that's the one that we'll use in, in this particular talk here. Okay, so um, how does the hunter implement this strategy? Well, in the simplest case, it just performs an E star search to find the short path using consistent H values. And, and, and this here is how I will um, illustrate this. So the hunter here will always be on top. Uh, the target will always be on the bottom. Uh, the blue part here is the expanded states that form the, the search tree. And then the, the yellow line here is the path that the hunter finds. And in this case, I mean, since the hunter performs an ESR search with consistent H values, this will be a shortest path. So um, the hunter moves along this path and the target moves anyway it wants, it can teleport, whatever, we, we don't really care what the strategy is. In this case, it moves off the path, and so the hunter performs another E star search. Now I need to press all of this onto one slide, okay? So first search here on the left, uh, second search on the right, and then of course there are many more searches that are down here that I will not show them. Now from time to time I want to show sort of more realistic game scenarios, so using the Hawk 2 environment here of Nathan Sturdivant, uh, in this case, the hunter will always be to the left, the, the target somewhere here uh, will always be to the right. Uh, the red cells are the cells that were expanded by the ESTAR search, so on the closed list afterwards. Uh, the green cells are the ones that were generated by the ESTAR search but not expanded, so on the open list um, afterwards. And again, the yellow cells uh, form the, the path of the hunter. And uh, during the talk here, I'll always uh, assume that diagonal movements uh, have cost one, makes it easier for you to count if you're interested in doing this. Okay, so far so good. I mean, this is a decent strategy. Everything that I told you works. Uh, there's one small problem. And the small problem is that in games, uh, a lot of the uh, CPU cycles that you have available 
uh, are used for things like the graphics, right? And whatever little is left for the EI needs to get split off among many, many different agents. So what that means is that you usually have very, very stringent time limits available for the search. Uh, and in fact, sort of a couple of, 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 of years ago, and I think it's the, the only figure that we have sort of officially in the literature, uh, sort of Vadim uh, Bulitko mentioned that BioWare um, imposes sort of time limits of one to three milliseconds for the search. So it gives you sort of some idea of, of where these time limits are. Now furthermore, right, so the idea here is that you partition time into sort of equally long time intervals and then you want the hunter to execute one move in each one of the time intervals and the reason for this is simply that this way the hunter will move very smoothly, right, and that's important in, in games as well. So, so back to our, our E-Star searches, so one of the problems that can arise now is that if you do an E-Star search in a larger environment, um, that the ESTAR search might not complete within the given time limit. It's not a problem for smaller trains. And in larger trains, I mean, you could use tricks like abstractions and, and so on, right? But if you want to do a plain ESTAR search in larger environments, uh, typically we will exceed these time limits. And so the question then is, well, so how do we deal with this? And what we do in the context of, of this talk here is we want to speed up these ESTAR searches. Now let me discuss two ideas um, for speeding up the, the ESTAR searches, and they will both become important. Um, so the first one here is, is simply to use incremental ESTAR search. So incremental ESTAR search speeds up the current search by using the experience that you gain with the immediately preceding similar search. So if you have a series of very similar searches, you can use incremental search um, to speed up the searches. And I want to use sort of a, a very, very simple, the simplest incremental search that I can think of, and they all have fancy names, so don't let that blind you, okay? This one is called FR, a star. Um, but, he, but here's what we are doing, okay? This is again our first search, right? And then the hunter moved and, and the target moved. But so when we completed the, the first search, the reason why the search tree is important is because for every cell in the search tree, uh, we have the property that we know the shortest path from the root of the search tree, so the current position of, of the hunter, to that particular cell, right? And so if the target moves at this particular point, and it moves to somewhere within the search tree, we don't need to do a search, right? We can just read off the shortest path. And that's important, okay? We can capitalize on this. But in this particular case, right, so the hunter moved, the target moved, um, so uh, the hunter now is no longer at the root of the search tree, and so now we need to identify this, this part of the search tree, for which is still true that we have this property that from the now current position of the hunter to these cells, we already know a shortest path, right? and that's very simple. It's simply the subtree of, of the search tree that's rooted in the now current position of the hunter, so this particular path. Okay? So that part, okay, uh, we keep in memory, we delete sort of the rest. Um, we um, uh, run around sort of this area, uh, collect the open list, and then we start an E-star search at this particular part. Okay, and it'll run, and the way I'll, I'll show this is like this, where sort of this gray area here shows the reuse part. Okay, so we, the E-star search does not need to do these node expansions because, uh, you know, these cells were already in the search tree and we're just reusing them. And then the, the dark blue part, as before, shows uh, sort of the, the amount of effort that the E-star search needs to do um, in, in order to complete the search tree. Yes? So here the red dot is the very same as in the previous Yep. Okay, and so, so what this means sort of in our, our more complicated game environment where I guess uh, the hunter moved from here to here, and the target moved to here, right? Is uh, we keep this particular part of the search tree rooted in the now current cell of the hunter, we complete the open list, right? And then we run the ESTAR search. Okay, so, so that means this is the first search, right? We didn't speed this up, but then we, we sped up the, the second search and all of these, these subsequent searches uh, using this technique. Now, um, I don't want to completely mislead you. You can't just look at, at this area here, right? Because, you know, to complete the open list and so on, you need actually a significant amount of sort of extra operations that, that I can't quite show here. But, but it turns out that in our case, actually, you can win quite substantially by, by doing that instead of doing a complete A-star search. 
However, there's one thing that I'm always very worried about, and that's why there's always sort of a big disclaimer here if you look into the paper. And it basically says, we don't have a good theory for, for incremental search uh, to some degree, right, because we are talking about small time intervals, a big more analysis doesn't apply, and so it really all depends on the circumstances, right, on how you implement the algorithms. For example, uh, which data structure you use to implement the priority queue of the algorithm. Right? We always use a binary heap, it's a pretty, pretty slow um, data structure, but also a pretty general one, which is why you use it, also pretty simple to implement. But if you use uh, faster data structures, for example, it's not necessarily the case that this trick here will win, right? it can also change if it wins, or how much it wins. Okay? But in our case here, here this works actually, actually quite well. So that's uh, uh, idea number one. Uh, let's go to a completely different idea. So here's idea number two. Uh, now we reduce the runtime of the A star search with a weighted A star search. Well, so you all know, right? So if we calculate F values like this, if the weight is one, we get an A star search. As we increase the weight, typically the, the search time goes down, but also the path length of, of the path that we find goes up. Okay? And I'm just demonstrating this, this quickly here for you. Uh, where the hand diagram is here, you know, the target is here. If you search this with weight in 2.5, uh, the ESDA search takes to 13 sub expansions, search it with a weight of 1.5, 15 expansions, with a weight of 1, that's the ESDA search, 20 expansions, so the runtime indeed goes up. The path length goes down, here it's 11, it's still 11 in the small environment, here it's 10, and that's the shortest path. And of course, that's even more pronounced if we go to these more realistic environments. So compare the red area, sort of as a proxy for the runtime against the length of the yellow path, here's a weight of 1.6, 1.4. 1.2 and 1. So here you see this effect sort of very pronounced. And so the idea here then, then simply is that what we'll do is we'll replace our A star searches with weighted A star searches. So that's sort of randomly picked the weight here, weight 2. Okay, so we need more to find the shortest path, and that's what these snake uh, lines here, here show. So far, so good. Now we have the problem that. You know, the time limit is just a soft time limit, uh, but overall, right, I mean, we want to find a path within the time limit, and so typically you want to set the weight very conservatively so that the search completes within the, the time limit, and so you will pick a pretty high weight, and so there's a chance that the search completes and you still have time left over, and of course, you, you don't want to waste this time. It's very hard, you know, to given a search program a time limit to pick a weight so, so that uh, you need almost all of the time. So now if we have time left over, right, I mean, so we can play the standard trick and say, okay, so in this case, we just run sort of a, a second weighted A star search, we decrease the weight a little bit, and if that completes within the time limit, we presumably find sort of a better path that we can use for the hunter, and if there's more time left, right, we can do it again, and so let's assume that at this point in time, um, the uh, time interval is up, so we can complete the, the third search, and, and so this means, right, I mean, that we'll use that path here for the hunter. Now, one of, of the interesting things here to notice, um, and if you know this, this ERA star algorithm, you know this already, is that if you look at all of the searches that we perform within the given time limit, so this one, this one, um, and so this partial one here, well, these are very similar searches. Um, same start, same goal, same terrain. I mean, the only thing that really changes is the weight. Um, and because of this, we can use incremental search to speed up the searches. And, and there is a technique out there that does this. Um, it's called ERE star. As I said, all the fancy names by Maxim Likachev. And I'll not tell you how it works. Okay, uh, if you have taken the real last tutorial, you probably talked about this. Uh, but I want to show you um, that it really does work. And so I want to go back to this example that I showed to you earlier. So if we did weighted A star searches, we need 13, 15, and 20 expansions. And if we use ERE star, we find the same paths, right? We just find them faster. We find uh, them with 13 expansions, one expansion, and nine expansions. And that is really interesting because if we look at the total number of expansions, these take a little bit longer than weighted A star expansions. So again, I'm fudging here. Uh, but the total number of expansions here is what, 23? Um, whereas the number of expansions of an A star search is 20. So with a very small overhead, we get this anytime behavior that we find a path quickly, and then if time is left, we find better and better paths. So that's the second idea, okay? So that's called ERE star. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is um, going from this tree here, tree A, 
the, this tree here, tree B. And I show that to you in a, in a game environment again. Um, so um, here's tree A, and here's tree B. And not very surprisingly, they very often have a lot of overlap, right? In this case, even more so than during idea one, because this here is a pretty wide tree, this is a pretty narrow tree. Uh, and so it does make sense now to utilize this idea one that we had earlier, this FR star idea, to say, look, we also want to be used, you know, between these two trees. And therefore, you know, we combine these two ideas and give it another fancy name. Um, and uh, so we reuse this tree here using idea number one. Okay, so how much did we actually gain? And I don't really react. Okay, so here we go. Um, now, what we want is we want to be able to perform these searches under very, very stringent time limits. And as I said, you know, in, in almost all cases, we want the first search to complete. We need that because otherwise the hunter doesn't have a path. And so I'm going to look at the, the first searches here, this one and this one. And again, I'll use sort of the, the dark blue area as a proxy for the runtime. So that gives me this. So this is basically sort of the, the time that it takes, uh, you know, given the combination. This was the time that it takes the, using the first idea alone. So you can see that we save significantly for the first search and all of the subsequent searches. And uh, here's the second idea alone. And here we save quite a bit during not the first search, but all of the subsequent searches. So that's basically the win. Okay, so um, this is the motivation for the paper. Let me quickly tell you on two slides what's actually in the paper. Um, so we developed this algorithm, we give pseudocode, um, and uh, here's sort of the algorithm in English. And it turns out that right, the idea is really, really very simple, uh, but the devil is in the details, right? I mean, here A star uh, needs a longer correctness proof, uh, and here we don't do A star searches, but weighted A star searches. So you need to be very careful how you combine these ideas and exactly what the termination condition should be and so on. Um, and so all of this is, is uh, in the paper, it shows the pseudocode, it explains the pseudocode, it shows the correctness proof and, and so on. Uh, I'll not bother with this here in, in the talk. Uh, instead, I'll, I'll go sort of directly to the main experimental results and again, I'll just concentrate on, on one of the experimental results in the paper. So uh, we use uh, 100 test cases with randomly selected um, unlocked cells for the hunter and the target. Uh, there is a path of the hunter to the target, so the hunter is able to, to catch the target. And then we do experiments both on four neighbor random maps as well as on four neighbor game maps. Um, the random maps have 25% randomly blocked cells. Uh, the game maps are a version of Warcraft 3. We take all of these domains from the standard uh, repository. Uh, that's again Nathan Sturlevin's repository at movingai.com. We use a very simple movement strategy for the target, where the target repeatedly follows the shortest path from its current cell to some randomly selected unblocked cell, and then it skips every tenth move. So the hunter really does have a speed advantage. And when the target reaches um, uh, its target cell, uh, then it just repeats the process. All of the items were implemented in similar ways. In particular, we did use uh, binary heaps, as I mentioned before, to implement the algorithms. And uh, the time limits here are really soft time limits in the sense that if one search takes longer, um, then we let the first search in each time interval complete to avoid having to move the hunter in some greedy way. And then we use uh, uh, sort of um, a straightforward weight uh, decreasing schedule. Um, the first one that, that we actually tried out, so it's not really tuned to this particular problem. So we have experiments on uh, random maps as well as on game maps um, with similar results. So let's quickly look at the game maps. I just want to concentrate on this one here. So pretty stringent uh, time limit, but then again, the maps are, are pretty, pretty small. And here's what we see. This is idea one, idea two, the combination of the ideas. How long does it take for the hunter to catch the target? So, so idea number one, that finds the shortest path always from the hunter to the target is best. That's not really surprising. Here, we find suboptimal paths from the hunter to the target, uh, and that results in the hunter taking longer to catch the target. And it really is the case, um, what I should have said earlier, um, here we use incremental search to speed up the searches here. And that means that we can perform more searches per time interval than we can do here, and therefore we find better paths for the hunter 
than we find here, and that means that the hunter reaches the target eventually faster than it does here. And in terms of, of how well we utilize the time intervals, I'm showing here uh, the percentage of times that the first searches exceed the time limit, right? That's why it's a soft time limit. And so, so we can see here that these ones here, that quite a few searches exceeded, um, whereas this one here, we, we sort of uh, hit it uh, quite closely. Okay, so that brings me to the conclusions. Thank you. Um, so in general, right, I mean, replanning is important when the search problem changes. Um, and in particular, right, I mean, in robotics, people often study this case here. So what changes is the knowledge of the hunter. But they, they, they study cold rapid navigation and unknown terrain towards a stationary target. And what changes here is the knowledge of, of uh, the hunter about the train, because it learns new things about the train as it moves about. We study sort of a different problem, a different reason for real planning, because we study here cold rapid navigation in known terrain towards a moving target. And so what changes here is the knowledge of the, the hunter about where the target is. So we develop this this new algorithm, which is really a combination of uh, two existing ideas, but the devil is really in sort of how, how to make this technically work. Um, and the idea here is that this algorithm here can run under very, very stringent time limits and, and find a path for the hunter. Not necessarily the best one, but a pretty good one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so in, in this particular case, we, we do search forward. Um, and moving forward here has an advantage, it turns out, right? And the, the advantage here is how the start of the search actually moves. Since the hunter follows the path, okay, the root of the tree remains on the path. The target can move any way it likes. If the target remains on the path, great, okay, we can use exactly this trick here. If the target moves away from this, then, then this really doesn't work, right? And, and therefore, it's actually important that we search from the hunter towards the target for this particular idea to do well. Just a little niggly thing. Um, you spoke about this soft time limit, and I noticed that uh, you were exceeding the time limit in a few cases. That quote from BioWare seemed so stringent, like, you know, they will chop off our heads and tell us to leave the room if we take longer than three milliseconds or something. Yeah, so, so this is a little bit tricky, right? Because it, it really depends on sort of the obstacles that you see in the environment, how long a search takes. And if you really, really want to stay within this time limit, then usually you cannot guarantee this with full searches. If you do a full search, you want to find a complete path from the hunter to the target, there will be cases right, where you place the obstacle so that, that the search actually has to do a lot of effort. Uh, and, and obviously, even weighted based star searches, we could have set the weight much, much higher, uh, you know, and, and then go from there. But there is sort of a, a tricky trade-off, right? If you set the weight too high, right, and then you decrease it, you do a lot of work, right, on very suboptimal paths. And so, so my feeling here is that you actually gain from viewing this as a soft time limit. You know, we have hard time limits, we have some other items that search, say, with a limited look ahead, or items like the like A star, right, that only a certain number of node expansions, and, and then guarantee that you find some way of, of moving the hunter. If you find complete paths, though, you get sort of, of a much more sensible strategy for the hunter because the hunter doesn't, doesn't make any moves that are sort of greedy in the way that immediately afterwards it has to make a move sort of back to, to where it came from, which looks somehow odd. So my feeling is, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure, I haven't really talked to someone from a game company of whether they could tolerate this or not. Uh, they are often very, very worried about sluggish behavior or, or some behavior that looks unrealistic, right? Because they feel that that's sort of a turn off of the players. Uh, but my feeling is that if they are willing to tolerate this, then viewing this as a soft um, time bound has uh, huge advantages. It doesn't really sacrifice a whole lot. Any other questions for Sven? Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so this brings us to our second part sampling based coverage. Path planning for inspection of complex structures. What a beautiful picture that is. 
Uh, the work is by uh, Brendan Englund and uh, Franz Hover, and Brendan will be giving the talk today. Thank you. So, yes, I'm Brendan Englund. I'm a PhD student in the MIT Mechanical Engineering Department. And uh, over the course of the next 20 minutes, I'll tell you the story of how we get this picture, uh, which is a path, a feasible um, full coverage inspection path that not only avoids obstacles, but uh, plans in the presence of hundreds of thousands of coverage constraints. So, the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll introduce the problem and uh, some relevant background, and specifically the application in mind here is autonomous in-water ship haul inspection. Um, and then I, I hope to convince you why the, the sampling-based planning is important and useful in, a, in our specific application where we want to achieve coverage of complex 3D structures. Uh, then I'm going to present a snapshot of the analysis that's in our paper of sampling-based feasible coverage path planning which we, uh, as others before us, have, have solved in two phases where we, we break it apart into a group planning problem and a multi-goal path planning problem. Uh, and I'll give you a detailed look at the probabilistic completeness of the sampling-based view plan uh, component. Uh, then I'll show you some results from an improvement algorithm we've developed for shortening feasible inspection routes and uh, some of the theoretical guarantees and computational results that we produced. Uh, and then a snapshot of something that we've gotten very recently from a field experiment uh, actually implementing this algorithm. So this is the, the robot that motivates this work, the Hovering Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. Uh, it's a free-floating, fully actuated, six degree of freedom, hover-capable underwater vehicle. It's quite different from your traditional uh, torpedo-shaped AVV. Uh, this is designed to do precision hovering in the vicinity of a structure for inspections. Uh, the goal, of course, is an autonomous in-water ship fall inspection with uh, mine detection as, as the objective. Uh, the Navy currently uses teams of divers to sweep ship hulls to look for mines, and they would very much like to automate this task. Uh, this project began at, uh, as a joint effort between MIT Seagram and Bluefin Robotics uh, starting in 2002. I've been involved with the project since 2007. And uh, now this has kind of spun out of the lab and is produced as a commercial product by Bluefin Robotics and 15 have been purchased by the U.S. Navy and they're currently uh, training on these to, to perform the inspection. <coughs> but uh, right now they're using it primarily for this part, which we call the non-complex area of the ship hull, this, which comprises about 80% of the ship. It's the flat, um, not very complex uh, you know, components of the hull that you can sweep over using a rectangular back and forth sweep pattern and using the sonar, uh, in fact, I should say a little bit more about the sonar. The sensor that we're using for this, uh, unfortunately, since we need this vehicle to operate in turbid water environments, uh, we don't have cameras or lasers at our disposal. We have to rely on uh, an imaging and ranging sonar. Uh, it's capable of sensing in two different modes that I'll describe in, in a short while. Uh, and for navigation relative to the ship hull or relative to the seafloor, we use a Doppler velocity log, which projects four acoustic beams either down at the floor or at the wall or at the ship itself, and it gives you your position relative to the hull which drifts over time, but still is, is fairly accurate over short time scales. And so uh, we navigate relative to the hull itself to look at the relatively flat portions of the hull. The sonar is operated in what we call imaging mode, in which there's a, a rather wide vertical aperture, and it's used to produce a flattened 2D image that's several square meters uh, in the area. And it gives a pretty good idea of what's present on the hull. Uh, there are, you can't really recover the 3D structure from this type of imagery though, and so if you have something like a shaft, which you see here, there isn't really much hope of, of recovering a 3D model from that. But if, if you're looking at something that's relatively flat, perhaps you could perform a reliable mine detection. And here, you can see these zinc anodes on the ship hull stand out pretty well. The problem that I care about specifically is inspecting what we call the complex areas, the remaining 20% of the ship, where you have complex 3D protruding structures, uh, and really, you can't point the DVL at the ship itself. There's too much variation in the structures protruding from, from different locations. You would lose the DVL lock and, and your frame of reference for navigating. So we point the DVL at the seafloor instead. Uh, and we have to maneuver in the vicinity of these structures and obtain 100% coverage. We're using a slightly different sensor, though. We're using uh, the Ditson in basically a range scanning mode, where the vertical aperture gets focused down and you obtain the equivalent of, of what is a pretty narrow aperture range scan. Although it's fairly noisy and you're, you're constantly having to uh, you know, deal with the second returns phenomenon of acoustic sensing, where you get competing signals with the, with the objects you're looking at. Um, but nonetheless, it gives us views of these structures. You can see here, this is a scan of a seven, to, uh, seven meter diameter propeller and a one and a half meter diameter shaft. 
And here's another uh, example in video form of the data as it's coming in, passing underneath the ship, looking up at its shaft and then at its propeller, the same um, structures that you saw in the previous slide. And uh, another trade-off with this sensor that's pretty interesting for mine detection is we get improved resolution if we're willing to sacrifice the range of the sonar. So if we cut off, uh, in this case, if we have the viewing range, we have uh, twice the resolution in the imagery. And uh, in this case, it allows some of the fouling on this propeller to become a little more easily visible. Um, but this is certainly desirable for mine detection. So we're not only are we, are we taking this expansive structure and trying to cover it with a small robot, but we're also shrinking down the footprint of the, center, the sensor and really trying to, to paint the structure with a pretty small field of view. So there are some assumptions we're making on the robot for this planning problem. We're assuming that the HAUV Hold station at each individual location where a view is planned. It sweeps its sensor through 180 degrees of pitch and it collects a volumetric sample, giving it range data uh, of the structures on the ship hull. We assume the HEV has four degrees of freedom, X, Y, Z, and yaw. It's not capable of very aggressive maneuvering and roller pitch, and so we simplify it in the, in the following way. Um, we also assume every scan, as we showed in the prior slide, has a 30 degree aperture, and uh, we're looking pretty close to get good views if there are mines in the image. So we're looking at about one to three meters range. So here's the problem statement. The input is a mesh model of the structure that we want to inspect. We have a model of the robot, and we have the geometry of the robot's field of view. Uh, the output is a collision-free inspection tour, where the robot begins where it began for, or where it ends where it began for easy deployment and recovery. Um, and in that tour, observes every vertex in the mesh model. And in the previous mesh models you saw, there were hundreds of thousands of vertices. Uh, the ver the um, mesh model is discretized such that if you were to observe every vertex, you would see a mine if the mine was present on the ship hull. You could also orient this problem so that the triangles of the mesh could be observed. That would be a pretty, pretty easy reconfiguration to make. Um, the key assumptions are that we have a model-based path planning problem that is geometric in nature. This isn't a very fast-moving vehicle. It tops out at about a quarter meter a second. So really, it's a geometric positioning problem where we want to obtain feasible views of the most occluded and low clearance areas at the start of a ship. And, and uh, of course, one of the reasons why it's geometric is because the HAV is heavily dominated by hydrodynamic drag. And as I mentioned before, this is a discrete problem. The robot stabilizes at each configuration and sweeps its sensor before moving to the next configuration. When I re refer to discrete and continuous, I, I refer to the fact that there are often many algorithms in coverage that assume a continuous sensing process where the robot is moving and operating its sensor in continuous time, con uh, continuously sampling data as it's moving about its workspace. Here's an example of the desired output. A tour in which the robot stops at each individual waypoint, takes a snapshot of its sensor, moves to the next waypoint. And over the course of this, as you see, each individual sensor snapshot is changing over the course of the, of the color spectrum that we wrap around this tour. Um, the robots gradually obtaining full coverage of the ship hull by visiting each of these waypoints that were planned. And it should wrap around the end of the rudder and complete its inspection. So the contributions of our work. We believe this is the first probabilistic completeness analysis applied to robot coverage path planning. We take some tools from coverage collision-free path planning and um, accommodate them, or we, we um, modify them to accommodate the vast number of coverage constraints that this problem is facing. We bound the convergence of the sampling base routines using decaying exponential functions. We also show an improvement algorithm that's, uh, it iteratively shortens the coverage routes, and it's also compatible with our T star, uh, which I'll get to toward the end of the talk, and retains its optimality properties with respect to a local subproblem that we define over this tour. Uh, and we'll show some computational and experimental results as I mentioned earlier. So some prior work in coverage. 2D structures have, been, have comprised the vast majority of prior work in coverage path planning. Many of them just look at the problem of covering the open floor area oops, of a 2D workspace and uh, avoiding obstacles. Others look at boundary coverage. These might be a little more ripe for extension to 3D because you can apply them iteratively as 2.5D algorithms and kind of slice through a 3D workspace using them uh, over and over again. Um, discrete coverage planning in which you stop it, take an individual snapshot of the sensor, has often been <coughs> captured using the art gallery problem in which uh, th this is kind of a, a classical computational geometry problem in which you have to place a certain number, the minimum cardinality number of guards that can observe the entire um, continuous boundary of a, of a polygon. 
and, and a variety of uh, successful heuristics have been developed to cover those spaces quickly. Uh, other optimization methods have been used for discrete view planning, as well as random sampling, which is a method that we're going to advocate as well. And then there are some that have been developed specifically for 3D path planning. As I mentioned, there is the method of, of iteratively slicing over a structure and creating a loop that covers the entire boundary. We've seen that applied in a few different contexts, uh, inspection of, of a building by aerial vehicles in this case. When you have an infinite field of view, you can apply a corridor diagram and that will obtain full coverage, although we're working with a, a definitively finite field of view, so we can't use this algorithm. Uh, it's also somewhat limited by the computational complexity that scales in the geometry of the problem. Uh, and other methods have gone about by partitioning structures into segments and developing sweep patterns that cover each segment. In the discrete realm of coming up with individual views that stop and take a snapshot of the structure, uh, a common approach is to assume that some sort of what I to call turntable coverage of objects, where the object is small enough that you can place it in the center of a room and look at it from a variety of vantage points. These are a smaller degree of freedom problems, generally, in which you can actually map out the entire topology that maps from every possible view on this uh, tessellated sphere to every um, primitive on the, uh, in the model of the structure. Uh, but we're going to advocate sampling-based planning for the construction of a, of a truly global 3D coverage path. And, and here's why. We, we believe that the ship hull inspection problem represents a coverage problem with low clearances. Uh, it may be the case that a single slicing direction that cuts across this with 2D slices uh, may not necessarily find you a feasible path if a feasible path exists. Uh, and similarly, if you choose one orientation for a sweep-based privilege, you may fail to find a feasible path. It's also scalable to high dimensions, and in the case of such an expansive structure, you may not want to map out the full coverage topology from every view on, on, a, on a discrete grid to every primitive in the structure. Um, and so we seek guarantee of completeness, and that's one of the reasons why we're using sampling-based algorithms. And in fact, there are sampling-based algorithms for this task, but none of them have been shown to be complete. Uh, so this is a property we're very interested in, to be able to show in the limit, maybe hopefully in, in a short amount of time as you're drawing samples, you can. Uh, guarantee that you'll find full coverage if a feasible solution exists. So typically this problem is broken down into two components, uh, which really is a simplification of sorts. It's saying that I would like to have a minimum cardinality set of discrete views that observes the entire boundary of these structures. And then after you find the minimum cardinality set, you proceed with multi-goal planning, linking them together into a feasible inspection group. Of course, there is a single objective that could be used to represent this function, in which you have weights assigned to the cost of collecting a view and the cost of travel. Uh, but really, there are only a few catastrophic counterexamples where, where breaking it up into two pieces goes awry. And they tend to be in situations where you have an infinite field of view and you can move infinitely far from the structure. And this is certainly a case where we're in a very confined environment where we have a very narrow field of view. And I also want to note that we're sampling the structure boundary here. We're, we're implementing a variation on the dual sampling method of Gonzalez, Banos, and Latone, where we actually sample part, uh, components from the structure boundary itself, and then we map to a region of configuration space in which robot configurations are sampled that we know will map to views of the point on the structure boundary. Now, in our case, we have a variety of collision and occlusion hazards that can interfere with that, but we still pick regions where, at least geometrically speaking, we know that the sensor field of view um, contains the uh, primitive that we're hoping to observe. So you see the samples tend to be relatively close to the structure, and we don't waste any time sampling out here. So here's an illustration of this two-step approach that I've been talking about. We sample configurations to obtain 100% coverage of the mesh. In our case, we have an algorithm, the redundant roadmap algorithm, that demands K coverage of some redundancy K. Maybe each primitive has to be observed three times. We then choose a set, plan a path that connects all of the views, and then try to smooth that path. So we bring together two different algorithm analysis concepts here. One from planning feasible paths, in which we care about random samples landing in worst case regions that you need to join two robot configurations together. And another, another uh, group of analysis problems in which there has been an interest in uh, guaranteeing continuous coverage of the workspace in a, in a number of samples that has appealing convergence as the, limit goes, uh, as the number of samples goes to infinity. But what we're doing is adopting these tools to, to guarantee coverage of a discrete set of primitives rather than the continuous surface of a structure. And there are some reasons for doing that. We look at robot configuration space and workspace as a set system in which the discrete robot primitives 
are observed by configurations. And each configuration represents a set of primitives. And in turn, each primitive represents a set of configurations that maps to a view of that primitive. This framework has been used in analysis. that is appropriate to the coverage problem. Uh, and we also establish a theorem of probabilistic completeness that gives us exponential convergence as the number of samples goes to infinity. Uh, I, had, I had an interest in possibly working through the details of this proof, but I think in the interest of time, I'm going to have to just give you the, 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 the best parts, the summary of it, which uh, essentially says, uh, in the limit, as the number of samples goes toward infinity, the probability of algorithm failure varies uh, as a decay exponential in the number of samples times the worst case volume <coughs> fraction of any one oops, excuse me, of any one of these visibility sets that maps to the sighting of a primitive. So whichever one of these happens to be the smallest and has the smallest set of feasible configurations, uh, that's what determines the convergence of the sample procedure. We're able to establish this invoking some tools from the analysis of probabilistic roadmaps and RRTs, and we adapt it for K coverage. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to gloss over that and, and, and bring it to the paper, but it does have a few positive results. One of the things it shows us is that we really don't want to simplify the problem or reduce its dimensionality by taking two and a half deep slices of the problem, because there could be cases where that actually takes our volume fraction epsilon and makes it far worse when, in fact, a better epsilon exists by treating the problem as a full 3D problem. Uh, even by plugging in some rather, uh, some rather tough numbers into this, uh, into this formula, we're able to see that in cases of a million primitives, a very unappealing volume fraction, and uh, k equals 10 coverage, um, the probability of failure still hits zero in a pretty reasonable number of samples between 10,000 and 100,000, which we achieve in a, uh, a minute or two uh, in the actual implementation of this algorithm. So uh, the outcome of this analysis was that the view planning routines we hope to show were probabilistically complete. They are, they are probabilistically complete as are the multi planning routines. They're governed by decaying exponential functions. There's just one case in which the two components put together might give you a problem. And that's a case in which you have a robot entrapped in what I call as a prison cell. Uh, if, 